Welcome back to Plug Life Television, where we've got another misconception for you today. Is it greener to run an old petrol car than it is to build a new EV and battery pack and run it for the same number of miles? This is an argument that's regularly used to justify running old sports cars, pickup trucks and SUVs. Now, to answer this one, I'm going to be very generous towards the old petrol car. I'm only going to consider its exhaust emissions, whereas for the EV, I'm going to assume that it's been made using some dirtier electricity. So this will be a bit of a challenge for the EV. Let's see how it all pans out. Some petrol heads claim that it takes so much energy to build an electric car and its battery pack that it's greener to run an old petrol car for the same period of time since it has already paid off its embodied energy from its manufacture. But is this actually true? In this example, we'll compare the exhaust emissions of an old petrol car to the CO2 emitted from building an EV in its battery pack and driving it for a total of just 80,000 miles before retiring it. Take a typical classic car of the 60s or 70s. Let's say that it emits 250 grams of CO2 per kilometre, which is very generous since it will most likely emit a much higher amount. This works out at 400 grams of CO2 per mile. We shall deliberately ignore well-to-tank emissions from petrol, that is, the CO2 emitted from extracting, shipping and refining it, and we shall also ignore embodied carbon of the chassis. Based on exhaust emissions alone, the petrol car emits 32 tonnes of CO2 over 80,000 miles. Now let's look at the electric car. Looking at figures from the French Energy and Environment Agency and from Volkswagen, a reasonable figure for the embodied energy from chassis manufacture is about 21,000 kilowatt hours. There is no mention of how much of this energy involves electricity and how much of this energy involves heat, for example to melt the steel, but I shall cruelly assume that it is all electricity and that that electricity all comes from a gas-fired power plant. We will not use any of the excess heat from the plant to help produce the chassis. We shall use the IPCC figure for gas electricity of 490 grams of CO2 for every kilowatt hour produced, which works out higher than the average emissions of most major grids in Europe and the US. From this, the embodied carbon of chassis manufacture is found to be 10.3 tonnes. Next up is battery manufacture. There are wildly fluctuating figures regarding the embodied carbon of batteries, but I'm basing my figures on the US Environment Protection Agency, because they have shown they're working and have reached one of the more pessimistic results. Converting two gigajoules of embodied energy per kilowatt hour of battery capacity to kilowatt hours of embodied energy per kilowatt hour battery capacity, and assuming a 30 kilowatt hour battery pack, we find that we have 16,680 kilowatt hours of embodied energy. If all of this energy is from electricity, from gas, that equates to 8.2 tonnes of CO2 to produce the battery. As for emissions from the electricity used to drive the car, the UK grid is rapidly decarbonising, so 240 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour is a reasonable figure to use. A typical EV manages 4 miles per kilowatt hour of electricity, so this equates to 60 grams of CO2 per mile driven. Therefore, for an EV driven 80,000 miles using the standard UK grid mix of electricity, the carbon emissions from driving is 4.8 tonnes. In total, the CO2 from building the EV and the battery from gas-fired electricity, driving 80,000 miles on the UK grid mix, and scrapping the car completely unnecessarily after just 80,000 miles, is 23.3 tonnes. Despite being kind to the old petrol car and biased against the EV in these calculations, the EV still saves 8.7 tonnes of CO2 versus the old petrol car, and that's ignoring the well-to-tank emissions that arise from the production of petrol. So there we go, even when you use dirtier electricity to produce the electric car and the battery pack, it still works out as the cleaner option over only 80,000 miles, which we know that electric vehicles are capable of going a lot further than on their original battery. Now, as far as classic cars go, I want to pit it against the toughest car that it could possibly go up against, my own. Yes, the Mark I Honda Insight, capable of 70 miles per gallon on the motorway without even trying, one of the most aerodynamic cars ever mass produced, and because of its aluminium chassis, it only weighs a few kilograms more than a Formula One car. Let's see how the EV can compare to that. The tank to wheel emissions of the Insight will be around 100 grams of CO2 per kilometre by this stage in its life, which works out at 160 grams of CO2 per mile. Again, we will ignore the well to tank petrol emissions 
and the CO2 from the construction of the aluminium chassis. Over 80,000 miles, the Insight produces 12.8 tonnes of CO2, a saving of 10.5 tonnes versus the EV. <gasps> oh. However, we already know this isn't the full story. Let's consider the well-to-tank emissions for the Insight. It takes 6 kilowatt hours of energy to produce a gallon of petrol. Rough calculations based on figures from Grangemouth Refinery suggest that about 2 kilowatt hours of that energy is from electricity, with the rest being heat. I shall generously assume that a gas combined heat and power plant provides all of the energy required. That is, that it produces 4 kilowatt hours of heat for every 2 kilowatt hours of electricity. This works out at 980 grams of CO2 per gallon of petrol produced. Since the Insight has a fuel economy of 70 miles per gallon, this gives well to tank emissions of 1.1 tonnes of CO2 over 80,000 miles. Even if we're still conveniently ignoring the carbon from extracting and shipping the oils to the refinery. From this, the EV is still nowhere near as clean looking as the old Insight. But there's more. Grids around the world are getting greener as are car and battery factories. BMW and Tesla's major plants are prime examples of automotive and battery factories that are running largely on renewables. The EV in our example is a Nissan LEAF, which is built in Sunderland in the northeast of England. Based on UK grid figures, the embodied carbon of its chassis manufacturer is just 5 tonnes, and the battery is just 4 tonnes, bringing its lifetime CO2 emissions down to 13.8 tonnes. 100 kilograms of CO2 less than the Insight's petrol emissions over the same period. In fact, the grid in the northeast of England is particularly low carbon, getting over half of its electricity from nuclear power, with wind and biomass making up most of the rest. Therefore, the embodied carbon from the Leafs manufacture is even lower than calculated here. For EVs that are manufactured in plants that use renewables, their embodied carbon is a fraction of the Leaf. According to the IPCC, solar has a carbon intensity of 45 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which in our example equates to one tonne of CO2 emissions from chassis manufacture, 800 kilograms of CO2 from battery manufacture, and, if the battery is recharged using solar power, 900 kilograms of CO2 from 80,000 miles of driving, giving a lifetime emissions total of just 2.7 tonnes of CO2. The Insight's emissions over the same period are over five times higher. That's a worst case scenario for renewables. Wind power has a quarter of the carbon footprint of solar power. Furthermore, we haven't even talked about NOx emissions, nanoparticulate matter, and fuel leaks from the petrol car, which cause severe environmental damage. So the EV has comprehensively thrashed its toughest petrol opponent in a lifetime emission study that sees the EV retired about halfway through the battery's useful lifespan for no valid reason whatsoever. But if you really want to hold on to your beloved classic car, why not let electric classic cars loose on it? Once it's been converted into an EV, it won't only be cheaper to run and more reliable, but it will have chopped out over 10 tonnes of CO2 associated with the manufacture of a new chassis using energy from dirtier power sources, delivering a saving of at least 19 tonnes of CO2 over 80,000 miles versus original trim, and even saving a tonne or more of CO2 versus the inside. However, as stated earlier, 80,000 miles is an unrealistically low lifespan for an EV, so let's double the lifetime mileage to 160,000 miles, which EV batteries have already been proven to be more than capable of lasting. The electric classic car saves 10 tonnes of CO2 versus the Insight over 160,000 miles, even if the battery is made using dirtier electricity and the EV is recharged using just a standard UK mix of electricity sources. This saving increases to 17.8 tonnes if the car is charged using solar power, and 25.2 tonnes if the battery is made using clean electricity too. And let's not forget that when an EV's battery reaches end of life, it still has plenty of capacity left for second life applications such as grid storage before it is eventually fully recycled. You can only burn petrol once. Well that's that myth well and truly put to bed. Now, I've got three mobile phones worth of videos and photos to sift through from my recent trip to Norway, which has one of the highest rates of EV uptake in the world. So there'll be a fascinating two-part special coming up on Plug Life Television about the success story of EVs in Norway and also my own electric adventures when I drove out into the wilderness. So bear with me whilst I sift through gigabytes and gigabytes of data and get those episodes put together for you.